The Textual Confidence Collective has a bonus episode for you to round out our second season. Tim Berg and I sat down at a hotel in San Antonio, Texas, during the National Evangelical Theological Society meeting to talk to Byzantine majority text proponent Dr. Maurice Robinson about King James Onlyism. Honestly, I wish we could have recorded all of the before and after chatter that we had while we were setting up and taking down. Robinson's knowledge of the King James Only movement is long and personal. His knowledge of New Testament textual criticism can be given the same adjectives. He is a remarkable man. Nerds who enjoy discussion of New Testament textual criticism will thrill to hear this conversation, I promise. I got to ask Dr. Robinson some questions that I've wanted to ask for a good while, and so did Tim. To be clear, this bonus episode isn't really part of the Textual Confidence Collective second season because we didn't talk about Westcott and Hort with Dr. Robinson, but you'll see why we just had to sit with him and why we just had to share this conversation with you. Maurice Robinson shows in this talk clearly that his name cannot be invoked justly by King James and TR defenders in defense of their view. Neither can Dean Bergen's name, for that matter. I'm very grateful to Dr. Robinson for his time and to Tim Berg's, and I hope you feel the same way. Uh, Dr. Robinson, it was just an, you know, a privilege to chat with you. Yeah. And we really enjoyed last night. Now I know why Elijah talks about you so much. <laughs> And I just want to talk with you about the King James Version. I want to talk to you about King James Onlyism because, as you, I think, well know, the King James Only movement tends to use you as an authority. They say that they adopt the majority text, like August Dr. Robinson. When somebody in the King James Only world tries to invoke your authority, what do you say? I mean, well... The first shocker that comes to them probably is that I've never used the King James. The uh, first Bible I started using was a Revised Standard Version, which obviously didn't even follow the TR, let alone the Byzantine text, and I used that for at least eight years before I moved to anything else, and uh, my text-critical views at that time were still reasoned eclecticism, as I had talked about previously. So uh, even after I went to a Byzantine text position, I certainly didn't do it on the basis of the TR or the King James. I did use a Barry's interlinear when I was first learning Greek, but like I said on the other interview, what I followed was the footnotes, which continually departed from the TR and the King James. So. I never was attached to the King James, and I realize it can be a literary masterpiece, but so is Shakespeare, but, you know, I'm the kind of guy that I'd like that edition of Shakespeare, the No Fear edition, <laughs> where they have modernized the English so I can understand it all without having to see the little footnotes everywhere. Right. So I'm not a great proponent of the King James, and I'm surprised if they actually try to cite me because the TR, even underlying the King James, is hardly equal to the Byzantine text. They differ probably in around 1,400 or so places, and many of them are significant. So can you distinguish from your perspective as a leading proponent of a Byzantine priority position, I'm mean, not just a leading proponent, the leading proponent, You've given a lot of honor to your partner there, William Pierpont, right. who worked on the Robinson Pierpont edition. But can you distinguish, as King James Onlyism commonly does not, among the Byzantine family, the majority text, and the Textus Receptus? I commonly hear, and Tim, don't you as well? Yeah, for sure. All of those three blows blurred completely together. Well, you can start historically with the TR, and the TR. We understand how it was put together by Erasmus with his limited number of manuscripts. Some of them were very representative of a Byzantine text. He did not always follow all these manuscripts. And where they differed, he made some decisions. In some other places, he made he, you know, some other places he made conjectures, which is not even textual criticism. Revelation 16. Yeah, uh, Me or Revelation one, six, right. sixteen five. Okay, sixteen five. That was one, and also the ending of Revelation twenty two, uh, because his manuscript 
was lacking those verses, and he either by himself or with the help of Lorenzo Valla's uh, translation in Latin, he went back translated from Latin to recreate that, and he was pretty good. He created some words that have never appeared in any Greek manuscript of Revelation in doing so, but it didn't lose the sense. So in terms of the sense, it wasn't so bad. But it's still, the TR was not either a majority text or a Byzantine text. In fact, in Revelation, it's very hard to speak of a majority text because the Byzantine splits into two different lines of transmission, which are called the Andreas and the Q line. And where they agree, there's the Byzantine text. Where they disagree, a decision has to be made one way or the other. In the rest of the New Testament, you don't have that problem, except in the woman in adultery passage where it splits into three major lines of tape. That's my specialty. Of course, I did, but I also did my dissertation on Revelation too, so um, I'm very familiar with what's going on with both of those. But in the rest of the New Testament, aside from those, most of the TR is very close, but still, you know, close but no cigar. To, no to the majority or the Byzantine text. And as some have said, you could call the TR a sort of subtext of the Byzantine or majority text. Now, if you want to get to just the distinction between Byzantine and majority, yes. the majority is what it, the name means. It's right. the numerical majority. And this is what Gordon Fee seriously criticized because it's, basically comes down to counting noses. Right. And does that mean 50% plus one manuscript, and that's supposed to be the best or something like that? And the Byzantine uh, tradition doesn't even look at the numbers on that. In fact, when we created our Byzantine text, Pierpont and myself, our main concern was to eliminate the larger number of Byzantine manuscripts that have no real bearing on the text so we eliminated manuscripts from the 12th century onward, and yet the bulk of Byzantine manuscripts that were copied were from the 12th through the 14th centuries. But we didn't need them. We had a sufficient Byzantine text in the Byzantine manuscripts that exist from the 4th century all the way through the 11th. So that was sufficient to establish the text, and if we had the others, it just becomes window dressing because they're not going to contribute anything new or dramatic that would change anything. That is super helpful. Yeah, I've got my friend Timber here who is an expert mm -hmm. in these matters, an expert on the history of the King James, and has far more than dabbled in text-critical matters. I wonder what questions you have for Dr. Robin. <laughs> oh, I, I have so many. So I have often characterized the text of Erasmus, and I would distinguish just that first early edition and the many later editions mm -hmm. that come along. So we sometimes think of the manuscript basis of the TR and I think underestimate it. But I, I'd, I'd love to hear your opinion on this characterization. I have often characterized Erasmus's text and therefore, to a derivative degree, the later editions of the TR as largely Byzantine, together with a collection of some Western readings and some Erasmian innovation whether that be adding in Acts 9, 5 to 6 or Acts 8, 37, and then all those little mistakes that come, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, not just in the last section of, of Erasmus's revelation. I think throughout the book, we can count 60, and I think one scholar's counted 80 places where Erasmus incorporates a Latin reading and translates from mm -hmm. Latin into Greek. So I'm just curious how you would feel about that characterization. Do you like it? Is it right? Is it wrong? Tell me all the things I've done mistakenly. Well, it's not that mistaken. I mean, you can have a book by uh, Jan Kranz, which is on Erasmus and Biza as conjectural critics, where he discusses many of these things where sometimes readings were made up out of whole cloth uh, because, like in Revelation 16.5, Biza decided he needed to have it match with what was earlier in a similar phrase. So he said, well, all the manuscripts must be wrong, so therefore I'm going to change the text as I print it. And Erasmus did this type of thing several times. If they had just followed only their manuscripts, their TRs would have been a better text. But even so, like you mentioned, something like Acts 8.37, Acts 8.37 has around 60 manuscripts supporting, which 
sounds great, except when you say, well, at that point in Acts, there's about six to 700 manuscripts, and then you realize, oh, this is a minority text, and if you look at the compilation that is made from Text und Textwert from Münster, you will find that the division among the manuscripts, those 60 manuscripts, they divide in multiple ways, and out of the whole bunch, nearly all of them don't agree with the TR form of that verse. Right. And I think there's only one line of the thing that agrees with the TR form, and it's from very late manuscripts that may have themselves been copied from a TR. So uh, this is the thing. Uh, some people want that to be in because they think it's a great idea and it does reflect second century baptismal practice that you make a confession before baptism. But if you think of it in context without 837 in there, you've got the Ethiopian eunuchs saying, uh, basically, what prevents me to be baptized? Why would he even ask that question unless he's already been evangelized and has believed? Mm. And has been told that baptism is something that you're supposed to do now. Yeah. Right. It has to be. So uh, why would he ask the question and then be told, well, if you believe with all your heart, you may, and then he gives a confession? That does not make any sense except in terms of what they did in the second century and later baptismal practices. Yeah, which is a solid internal argument that you've made, not just in the basis yeah. of the manuscripts, and I agree with you. In King James Onlyism, Dr. Robinson, I constantly hear, if not the word, majority, the concept— so they'll say, we should stick with what 99% of the manuscripts say. When you hear that argument, how do you respond to a King James only? -ist? I'd say, well, are you willing to go with 99% of the manuscripts every time? And the answer is, of course not. Because just like the Acts 837, where they want to go with a smaller minority of the manuscripts, they have to have 1 John 5, 7, the Johannine comma in there. And we know what that is like. Uh, there are approximately 509 manuscripts of that passage, and there's only nine that have it, and they're all late except for one that actually the earliest one is of the 14th century, and otherwise it's found in Latin sources, and that's where it has found its way into the Greek, and the one from the 14th century happened to be a Latin Greek manuscript where the Latin influenced the Greek. So, Again, are they willing to follow the 99% of the manuscripts at that point? And they come up with every convoluted reason not to. Yeah, I, I've definitely felt the same thing, that actually, because that principle does not deliver to them Scrivener's Textus Receptus of 1881, suddenly you find that, you know, up their sleeve was this majority principle, where there's something even higher up their sleeve, there's another further principle, and they'll tend to reach for pretty much anything they can think of to to justify. And I've even heard them say, well, that must have been the majority at some point, but, you know, God, through his providence, guided the King James translators to choose what, and especially with Revelation 16, 5, what, what, what must be right. So the majority principle, they are willing to throw out. The we, instant we follow the majority except where we don't want to. Exactly. Then it's not a principle. <laughs> well, and that makes me curious, if I can chime in to ask a question there, because that argument makes an assumption that they can reconstruct or assume what a majority used to be. Yeah, and this is this becomes an argument. Possible. That's an argument from silence, though. They're saying, okay, we only have this small number now, but in the past there may have been hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts that read the way the TR did. But again, uh, are you going to argue from evidence or your own conjecture? And they have to argue from their own conjecture that way because without it, they don't have a case to stand on to say that this must have been the majority reading because there is no evidence for it. It's just a minority reading, and they're going to say we've got to defend it every way we can, so they come up with this convoluted reasoning. Right. Well, so um, I don't mean to steal a bunch of your questions, but I'm curious. So I know you've written on, like your blog for TCI, the influence of kind of a theology of Scripture and even a, a view of the preservation of Scripture on how we do textual criticism. I'm curious, if you were to take a theology of preservation like you hold, how would it wrestle with the question of what used to be there but had been lost? Now, would it be for you theologically possible for there to have been a majority reading in the text earlier 
that has now disappeared and is almost not found in the manuscripts. Pierpont and I would not accept that kind of concept because we don't argue from silence. It's that simple. We say, look, here is the evidence that God has allowed to be preserved, and it's the extant evidence. If God had not wanted this extant evidence to be preserved, who knows what we would have had. Would we have had only one and one only manuscript? Would we have had thousands that were already totally identical? Uh, you can argue any way you want for what preservation could have been, but again, you can't tell God how he has to do it. The way he has done it is based on the evidence he has preserved to us. And I have no problem saying that the Greek New Testament text was preserved, and I think that the true reading is there among our extant manuscripts. I don't accept the idea of conjectural emendation. I've had certain people that favor conjectural emendation, uh, usually in the, among the eclectics. Uh, they would differ from me on that because, you know, even the Nestle 28 edition now has, I believe it's now up to uh, three conjectures in the text. I would never accept any one of those. Sure. Dr. Robinson, Matthew 5.18 is one of the most commonly used proof texts for any kind of TR defense. Uh, you know, Jesus says, not a jot or a tittle right. will pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Do you interpret that verse any differently than you might expect a reasoned eclectic uh, proponent who's an evangelical and an eritist to interpret it? I don't think you can use that to deal with the textual variance per se. I think what he's saying is that the he's talking specifically about the Old Testament at that point because of the jot and the tittle tying in with the Hebrew alphabet. And he's basically saying what is written in the Old Testament will be fulfilled. That's where the point is. He's not saying there couldn't be, maybe there might be a minor scribal error. We know how the Jews copied the text, and if they did find errors, they would scrap the, this and everything. It, this didn't happen in the New Testament manuscripts, but they did copy very strictly. And he's referring to the fact of being fastidious, but it's so that the text is going to be plain, clear, and the fulfillment will take place of what is It'll be written. Effectual. It'll be effectual. Right. Yeah. Have you had people press you on this? I mean, no. I, I want to give as much um, credence as I can to my Christian opponents mm. that they're sincerely trying to obey God's word, even when we disagree. And their response to this, to your interpretation, which is mine as well, is, well, come on, Jesus said, not a jot or a tittle will pass from the law till all is fulfilled. You're the one who is taking the you know, the facts of history and making them override what Jesus clearly said. How would you respond to that? I would say they're the ones that are taking those two terms, which have nothing to do with textual variance. They're dealing with what is a little mark on a Hebrew letter. Uh, the jot is the smallest Hebrew letter, the yod, and the tittle are little de decorative crowns, that's what the kariah is, uh, that are on the letters. And he's not even talking about textual variation, so that's my answer to that. Uh, they're misapplying it to deal with the variants that we find among our manuscripts. And this is a misapplication of the passage. I think so, too. Can I bounce my quick response off of you? I would say that, what, similarly to what you said earlier, we want to deal with the evidence that God has actually preserved. And in essence, uh, the perspective that I hold, a textual confidence view, Tim Bold as well, you do too. We don't have an absolutely perfect text. You know, every jot and tittle, none missing or added, all in the right order. One big reason I know that is that I am trying to submit myself to the, to the acts of God in history, I can observe with my own two eyes. There is no manuscript of any size that is precisely identical with mm. any other. Now that's probably more in the New Testament. Because of the strict copying in the Old Testament, they probably did have identical manuscripts. But in the New Testament, uh, the most humorous thing is usually in Revelation where you have the warning of not to add to or take away from the text. Revelation has more variant readings some of them longer, some of them shorter, some of them substitutions and transpositions. 
they have more variant readings than any other book of the New Testament. And it's just sort of a wry humor to think that here's the book that warns against that, and yet look what the scribes have done. Right. So, uh, but it does it change the message of Revelation? And the answer is no. It'll change some of the wording and all of this. And yes, we have to be careful as we look at it to determine what is the precise wording as closely as possible. But you aren't going to find one manuscript in Revelation that's going to agree with the TR. And so the next stage of my argument has been, okay, if God intended to promise an absolutely perfect, every jot and tittle in the right place and none missing or added text, he would have had to give us further revelation to tell us which one it is. And you can't use the King James uh, as the means, you know, whatever d decisions they made, uh, in part because of things like Revelation 16, 5, in part because mm. other other Bibles of other nations made different choices. The Dutch Staten Vertaling I talk about, right. as the wise men came and found baby Jesus versus the King James wise men came and see mm. baby Jesus, that kind of thing. And that variant reading does vary among TR editions. Exactly. So you've exactly. got the Adon and Huron in that case. But this is part of the problem. Uh, the TR editions themselves differ Which among the TR, the, among the yeah. Texti Recepti is the perfect mm -hmm. one. And it certainly is not the Scrivener one. No. Uh, he said it was He openly said it wasn't. And in fact, he has an appendix, which they don't reprint in the Trinitarian Bible Society's edition of Scrivener. And his appendix shows about 60 places where even Scrivener admitted his reconstructed underlying the King James TR could not match the King James. That is so fascinating. It is true. I, I feel some frustration with our brothers that I love at the Trinitarian Bible Society. In fact, they show some evidence that they're aware of these things because they acknowledge, we're, they say in their bibliology statement, we are not going to judge among the differences among TR editions. Mm -hmm. And I say, then why do you constantly talk as if perfect preservation of Scripture is what Matthew 5.18 is promising? So a lot of these questions have been aiming at the overall question, do you hold a textual absolutist view or a textual confidence view? If I held a textual absolutist view, I'd have to say something is 100% exactly. identical to the autograph. And the only person outside of the King James circles that claim that would be Wilbur Pickering, where he claims that his Family 35 text, which does exist. There is a small group of manuscripts called Family 35, and it may have as many as 200 manuscripts, but more likely about 130, still a minority out of thousands of manuscripts that are there for the New Testament. But the Family 35 has no manuscripts following that family earlier than the 11th century, and most of them are from the 12th to the 14th, and even then they're still not in the majority. But Pickering has decided on his own theological ground, because apparently he's making a theological argument, that it is the perfectly preserved text, and he says his family 35 text is 100% equal to the autograph. Nobody else holds to that position. The majority text people don't hold to it. The Byzantine text people don't hold to it. And even if the TR like the thought, the TR people can't agree with his family 35 text because it differs too much from the TR. Your position is often called the majority text view. You've distinguished yourself from that. How, how insistent are you on making sure to clarify that that's not your preferred label? The easiest way to defend that concept, to call it Byzantine instead of that, Byzantine is certainly a line of transmission. Majority, like we said before, is counting noses. There are some places where the Byzantine manuscripts are closely divided. In some of those places, Pierpont and I actually follow a numerical minority reading. And in Revelation, there are even more places where we follow minority readings because the Byzantine manuscripts divide three or more ways, and the best you have, if you counted noses, would be a plurality. And so we do not always follow a numerical majority, although those cases are few and far between. 
But that's enough to say that we are not following a majority text. I have tended to say that perhaps the quickest argument against a pure majority text method is the le letters PM in the NA28, mm. pair multi, yep. a place where the majority, the, their, the, it itself is divided into any number of... Their, per, their pair multi is also uh, somewhat subjective because they are considering the split. Uh, per multi just means many on this side, many on that side. Or three sides or four or five. But their split is based on the manuscripts that they favor primarily, and the Byzantine merely gets thrown into the mix on this. It's not necessarily where the Byzantine itself is that divided, but if it's the Byzantine plus their otherwise favored Alexandrian manuscripts or Caesarean manuscripts and Western manuscripts, throw that into the mix, and that's where you get the division from, because they're certainly not out there counting all the minuscules either. So... Uh, but it does give you a reasonable guide to where there is some significant division among the manuscripts. And we recognize that in our edition. And if you look at the Robinson Pierpont edition, we have marginal readings. Why do we have them? Because that's where the Byzantine text is significantly divided. So we have one in the main text, which we consider usually on internal grounds to be the more likely reading, and the other one is in the margin which is the alternate reading, which very well could be original, but not necessarily. We don't know. And the truth is, one of the two is what we would consider the original reading, but because the Byzantine is split, we just can't say which. Dr. Robinson, sometimes when I have watched divisions in the Christian church over textual criticism and also translation, I have thrown up my hands to the Lord and asked, in my sort of Job-like moments, God, why did you do it this way? Oof. Could you answer that question? How, having you know, spent so much of your life as an inerratist, as someone who believes the gospel and the Bible, who loves the Lord, why do you think the Lord didn't just give us a perfect text and tell us which one it is? Who has known the mind of the Lord? You know, that's the question. Who has known? He did things the way he did. He chose to do it. It's not for us to say, well, you could have done it differently. I mean, this was, you brought up Job. That's his complaint. Right. Why did this all happen to me, you know? So, and why did God preserve the manuscripts this way? He chose to allow fallible human beings to act as scribes, to copy the manuscripts, to preserve the Word. And the truth is the Word has been preserved. It's not like I believe we're talking— no, it's not like everything has been lost, because by my own calculation, between the Byzantine text edition and, say, the current critical text, the Nessel Allen edition, they are running approximately 94% identical already. And if you only dealt with that 94%, you've already got a solid preservational basis that will be allowing to establish all basic doctrines, faith, and practice, they're all there. And with the 6% that's left, some of these variant readings are so small as to be a difference between and and but, chi or de, and just minor little variants that don't really change very much of the meaning. The ones that are important are the ones where they either omit or add a lengthy portion, but even then, the lengthy portions are not that lengthy. Some are whole verse lengths. And yes, I would much rather have the long ones with whole verses put back in. This is what happened with the ESV. They left them out. The Gideons wanted them back in. They made a arrangement with Crossway. And so the Gideons have now put all the verses back in yes. that were left out. Yeah. Uh, and these are what were footnotes in the ESV. They're just now in the main text of the Gideons. My only complaint there is they didn't go far enough. So. Right. <laughs> so, you know, we don't agree. I'm a critical text guy, and you're a Byzantine priority guy, but we agree on what's more important for the Textual Confidence right. Collective, that we must not say what God has not said. Right. Only, here's the text. This is the perfect one. Tim, you want to wrap us up with any questions? So, Dr. Robinson, I have a question that I'm curious about. You've studied uh, Dean John William Bergen's 
um, text critical method and positions and have distinguished yourself a little bit from it. We talked about that a little bit the other day in terms of his high churchmanship. But if Bergen were here today doing textual criticism, continuing his work in creating a text, would it look at the end of the day, because Bergen is claimed all the time by the people that mm -hmm. we engage in discussion with on a regular basis. The main the the independent right. fundamental Baptist King James only. Yeah. And they claim him all the time. I was pointed to him while in Bible college. I was right. he's the best defense that's ever been done. He's on but, the ambassador syllabus. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So from your perspective and your intense knowledge of his text critical method, and I think some people maybe mm -hmm. don't study him as much as they should or, or would, but you have, what would his text look like? Were he producing it all the way to the finish? Would it look more like a TR edition or more like the Byzantine text war? The answer is very simple. It would look like the Byzantine edition because we have proof of that in what his literary executor did, which was William Miller. Um, was it William Miller? Edward. Edward Miller. That's right. William Miller predicted Christ returning in 1844. Helped uh, edit Scrivener's yes. uh, work. But Edward Miller, as literary executor of Bergen's materials, had all kind of notes that Bergen had left, and he was going to publish these notes for the entire New Testament, but he eventually died after only the first volume was published. It covered Matthew 1 through 14, and there were 60 differences from the TR that Bergen favored. It turns out that out of those 60 differences, 58 of them agree with the Byzantine reading as opposed to the TR, and the other two are places where the Byzantine text happened to be itself divided among its manuscripts. So that evidence alone is showing the direction that Bergen would have been going. And the other aspect that I would always bring up to a King James only proponent who says Bergen is the key, uh, what do you do? Do you accept Bergen and all these places within his own publications where he says that the TR is wrong and needs to be changed. Yes. And Bergen has numerous references in the revision revised or in the later traditional text or the causes of corruption where he actually says the TR is wrong, here's what the right reading is. And when he does say that, the right reading is always the Byzantine. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. That's really helpful. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this discussion. Dr. Robinson, I hadn't been able to meet you personally until yesterday. We, we filmed mm -hmm. that little church down here in San Antonio, and it was just a delight to meet you. Thank you for being so generous with your time and for being friends with Elijah Hickson. That's a tough job, but somebody's <laughs> got to do yep. it. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> the Textual Confidence Collective hopes to do more work as time passes, Lord willing. Our current plan is to build on some common ground that we share with our textual absolutist brothers by pushing back against unbelieving textual skepticism. This will take some real work and some real time. Tim and Peter are both PhD students, and Elijah and I have been known to keep some plates spinning ourselves. Have patience with us, and we may pay thee all. But honestly, it might take two years or more. I hope not. A final note. It was the plane tickets and hotel bills and food costs associated with the first Textual Confidence Collective season that first led me to appeal for your support on Patreon, YouTube, memberships, and buy me a coffee. For over two years, you have come through. I have been so grateful. If you have profited from the Textual Confidence Collective second season, there were costs associated with it, too, and I would appreciate your gift or monthly membership at any of the services that I mentioned. Certain YouTube members get advanced look at my videos. Certain Patreon members get mugs and stickers. And Buy Me a Coffee donors get my undying gratitude. It feels pro forma, you know, perfunctory when others say this to me, but now I know that their feeling is genuine. I could not do this without you. Neither could any of us on the Textual Confidence Collective. Thank you.